Hello everybody, Adam Lusick here, and today we're going to answer the question of how do you actually evaluate a language model based application. One of the big issues that I've seen, and I've gotten a lot of questions on actually, is how do you actually determine a few things like what's the best LLM model? What's the best LLM to use for my application? Or how do you even just evaluate the performance of a language model based application? A lot of language models tasks are around things like content generation. And so how do you even evaluate, you know, accurate content generation? And so this problem statement that I have down here is that LLM applications are really very new and have limited resources for actually evaluating their performance. LLMs are super dynamic in their output and thus require, you know, very, very custom evaluations. Many people actually overlook this step or do their actual testing after a product has been developed in production with user feedback. And as a note, you know, as we've seen, a lot of the times this doesn't necessarily work out super well for everyone involved. However, our lovely friends over at Langchain have created Langsmith. And through Langsmith, we can actually do a lot of these experimentations and evaluations over our language model based applications. So we're going to dive into how to actually use a lot of the Langsmith's offering to set up very, very customized evaluations for your specific use case, which will give you the best results for actually evaluating the different performances of both your application and interchanging steps in your application or even the models itself that you're using. The Langchain team has also put together this phenomenal graph here of how to actually start thinking about evaluating your applications. They've broken it down into four steps, the data set part, the evaluator part, the actual task to be evaluated, and applying the evaluations here. So we're going to actually look into how I've set up very specifically some of these four different tasks that I go through. What it really boils down to is that the best evaluator is one specifically designed for your use case that you yourself are actually able to control. Since a general evaluation is not going to really give you the truth that you need to determine how well your application is running and how well a language model within your application is running. So to really break down and allow us to understand how you should be approaching evaluations and how you yourself can make these custom evaluations, I'm going to be going over a number of different approaches and topics of things that I've actually set up myself. So these are quite a few topics, and so I'll be using the chapters feature on the YouTube video to actually be able to segment these out. So if you see one that looks a little bit more specific to your use case, feel free to find that part in the chapters and jump to it to learn more. But we'll be going over creating and running custom evaluators to compare LLM outputs on a classification task. We're then going to be diving into using an LLM as an evaluator in an LLM as a judge flow. I'm going to do an overview of the built-in evaluators, as well as LLM as an evaluator with custom criteria. Then some things around summary evaluation of existing um, evaluations or experiments, pairwise evaluations of comparing experiments against each other, integrations with things like pie tests and unit testing, and then also I'm going to put this into specific parts of an existing workflow and show you how I put evaluations onto my Llama 3 research agent that I recently made a video on. And this is all very reliant on actually using Langsmith's data sets and testing section here. If we go into the data sets and experiments here, you'll see that I've cleaned it up. So we're going to be populating this over the course of the video and running these experiments and seeing how they show up. But just to give a little bit of an overview, if we click on the new data set stuff here, you can actually upload a CSV, do a name and a description. But then these data sets take the form of three different types. They've got the traditional key value, a different chat with like an input output dictionary or LLM data sets that have input dictionaries that contain a single input key mapped to a prompt string and outputs that are mapped to an output key. And using these different um, you know, data set schemas is how we're really going to be able to run these evaluations. And through the course of this video, we're going to be creating a few data sets to actually be able to run these evaluations on. So you should be familiar by the end of what a lot of this looks like, means, and how you can use it effectively. So hopping over to the code here, really the main thing that you're going to want to set up, which I have set up all the way in my environment already, is your Langchain API key. That's going to map you back to your Langsmith instance. And then I've also set up tracing and a project name 
because we're going to be setting up some, you know, real quick and dirty apps to actually do some of these evaluations on later on down the line. So for our first example of evaluations, I want to actually compare LLMs on their ability to classify um, social media comments with emotions. And so this is interesting to me because I have a fine-tuned model on this Go Emotions data set, which basically just has a text string of social media comments and then a labeled one of 27 including neutral emotions here. And so I want to see how my fine-tuned model might compare to just base models or other models of interest. And to do this, I go over actually this process a little bit more of how to fine tune and how I import these data sets from Hugging Face in this video right here in my how to fine tune and why for open AI models. But essentially, we're just loading this with the data sets package from Hugging Face and then pulling out just 20 random comments and emotions from the data. So running this real quick, this should not take too long. And then once it gets headed here, we'll see that perfect. We have this comment an emotion label. So it's going to be the comment here and then the emotion label here. And so then actually putting this into Langsmith, this is where we import the Langsmith client from the Langsmith package. We create an instance of the client with this and then we also create a data set name. I'm just naming it GoEmotions. And then you can use this client.createDataset method from the Langsmith client here. All this needs is the data set name and a description and then that will create this data set object. And then we use the create examples method. And what I'm doing here is just mapping the inputs, the outputs, and the data set ID. The data set ID is taken from the data set object with data set ID. And then the inputs and outputs are just going to be the comment here with the input. And then the output is going to be the emotion here, just looping over in a quick for loop. So putting that all together there and then hopping back over to Langsmith, we can see that now we have a new data set, the Go Emotions data set. And this is perfect because what we can do now is actually look at these inputs and outputs. And then what we can do is run some experiments on the input and then compare the output of the language model with the expected reference output from this data set. We first need, of course, an LLM app, quote unquote, to be able to compare this to. So I'm simply just setting up a LangChain chain to actually do a lot of this. And we're going to be evaluating the output of the chain on this data set with different models. So essentially, we're going to be setting up this chain, which is just an emotion classification prompt right here with all of the um, different emotions from the data set specifying that the output should simply just be the respective emotion and separated by comma if necessary. What we're going to be doing is comparing the different models. So I have GPT-4 Omni here, a fine-tuned LLM of GPT-3.5 Turbo on the Go Emotions data set, and then just baseline GPT-3.5 Turbo here. We're shoving these all into a chain, and that is going to be our application that we're going to evaluate. So now we have to actually define the custom evaluator function here. And so currently we have really two pieces of data. We have the data set social media comment and we have the data set assigned emotion labels. That's the comment and the labels right here, input and output. And we want to evaluate model performance on the data set social media comment in comparison to the data set assigned emotion label. So essentially we're going to be inputting this into the application and then comparing the output with our reference output here. Perfect. And so the below function that we have, we're going to assign a score of is same if it's, it's going to be one if it's an exact match, 0.5 if the LLM output partially contains the expected label, or zero if nothing is actually included. This is returned as a dictionary with a key and score. And so really to set this up, we have to specify the run and the example. And this is coming from our Langsmith schemas. And so run is the LLM run or the app execution and output that's being evaluated. Whereas example is how you actually specifically reference the data set. And so looking down here at our function, we have expected eval as the function for specifying the run as the input and the example as the input, and this will return a dictionary. And so the expected answer that I'm getting here is just taking all of the outputs from the example. So this is going to get mapped as it goes through line by line. It's 
it's going to take the output here, which in this case would just be optimism. And if it needs to be split, it'll split it by commas and then create a set of that. The response is then going to look at the actual run. So this is going to be referencing our LLM application, gathering the outputs that are under the identifier output, splitting if necessary, and then all this is doing is some simple if else checking to see if the sets contain exactly the same, partial, or none at all. We're then returning a dictionary key of either is same of one, is same of 0.5, or is same of zero, respectively. So let's define this. And then to actually evaluate these functions, we're going to be using the evaluate function from langsmith.evaluations. And so evaluate needs a few arguments. It needs the function, or in this case, it's going to be the chain to evaluate, a data set to compare against the evaluators that you're actually running. In this case, that's going to be our expected eval. And it's going to be taking this as a list because you can run multiple at a time if necessary. An experiment prefix for identification, and then you can pass in any metadata that you want to attach as well. So looking at actually setting this up, what I've set here is the evaluators as a list. So it's just going to be this expected eval right here. That's from this defined function. And then the data set name is Go Emotions. So that's where it's going to actually map to the Go Emotions data set. And then setting up our evaluate function here, it takes in <clears throat> the application function. So that's going to be just this chain. And so these are, as you can see, you know, 3.5, 4.0, and 3.5 turbo. It's going to be their respective chains. Data is going to the data set name. Evaluators are going to be the evaluators here. We're going to add a prefix. So for 3.5 turbo, obviously, we're going to put 3.5 turbo, 4.0, 3.5 T fine-tuned, and then a little bit of metadata, just a variant here to show what that looks like. So let's actually run these evaluations and see what comes up here. So I'm running the same evaluation, this expected eval on just all of these different models. And we can see them running through here and going swimmingly. So if we just take a look at this link real quick to see what this looks like, what we're seeing here is the experiment. So we're seeing test GPT 3.5T expected answer. <clears throat> that is exactly what I put here. And then you can see the output from the LLM and then the score that we've assigned. So what's happening here is this input is being input into this chain. It's getting the output. The output is being logged here. And then it's running the evaluator to see whether this output is the same as this reference output. So if we dig a little bit into this evaluator trace, we can see that this is exactly what happened. It got shoved into here with, believe me, this is the input here, the comment believe me, yada, yada, yada. And then the output here is disappointment. And then the actual evaluator is going to determine that it is the same as a score of 0.5 because disappointment appears, but it didn't get the disgust. And so going through, we can see all of these ran successfully and all of these got different scores. So that's perfect. Now that we have multiple experiments, we can actually go to this Go Emotions data set, and then we can see all of our experiments here. Down here, we're seeing that the different tests, which we specified here, are named as such. We can see that as this one's the fine-tuned one, the GPT-4 Omni, and GPT-3.5 Turbo. We can see the metadata that I put, variant, and then a little bit of the text here, as well as some additional evaluations here, if, oops, if needed. But we can see also an aggregate is same score. And so right off the bat, we can already evaluate that our fine-tuned um, model was actually able to get a is same score of 0.38 aggregated, which is much more in line with the reference of what I was looking for as opposed to for Omni or baseline 3.5 turbo. Let's dig into this further, however. We can select all of these and then actually click compare. And this brings up sort of a regressive comparison analysis that you can do here. So you can have a baseline. Let's select a baseline of the regular GPT 3.5 Turbo to compare to. And so then what we're seeing here is all three of the experiments and evaluations that we just ran in comparison to this baseline and the reference and input here. So all of these models got the same input, ran through the same chain, and then it's being compared in the reference 
with this is same score. And then over here, now that we're comparing the experiments, we're really comparing the is same score against each other. So we can see that just for this initial line, <clears throat> the base GPT 3.5 Turbo was actually doing better than the other two models. And they highlight this nicely with either red or green or no highlight if it's all the same. But then this gives you a very quick understanding of actually what to, what's um, different between each from the baseline. So we can see that the fine tune model actually had six improvements over the baseline, but also six regressions over the baseline. You can dig further into these to start to see the same, but the cool part is really, I feel you can see exactly each individual line and how they, um, how they all respond. But then looking at these aggregate scores here, we can see that the fine tuned model actually tended to perform much better than the others. So that's exactly what I was looking for. From this, I would determine that the fine-tuned model is the right one to use for the specific classification task if I'm looking to get these specific references as close as possible. So phenomenal. That's our first custom evaluation out of the way with a very hard-coded um, very hard-coded example here. But let's say you don't actually have something super hard-coded like a classification reference here. How do you necessarily evaluate something like a language model's ability for question and answering across maybe a document set? That's where you can start to do something really interesting with actually using additional larger language models, something more powerful like the Opuses or the GPT-4s, the 4Os, to actually start doing this, um, these assessments and evaluations on the different question answer pairs or expected question answer pairs. So let me break down exactly how to set this up and what that means a little bit more specifically. Our data set then is not going to be as simple as the last one. We're actually going to be doing uh, some inputs and outputs as questions and answers. So just putting this together, what I'll be doing is taking this blog post from Lillian Wang, and it's just a big overview on LLM agents. Super great blog post, one of the classics. And what I've done is I've generated some different question answer pairs. So we're seeing this input, like what is the primary function of an LLM and an autonomous agent? It'll say LLMs functions as the core controller or brain of an autonomous agent, enabling them to handle complex tasks through planning, memory, and tool use. This would be the example of, let's say like a user query and then an LLM output. However, these are going to then become our expected outputs that we can then run evaluations against. So putting these into the data set, or into the Langsmith data set. It's very simple, following the same process, creating the data set here with the name and the description, and then mapping the question and answer right here with the client. And so looking at that, hopping back over to our data sets, we now have a second data set, this agent data set. And we can see that the inputs here are now going to be questions, and the outputs here are going to be LLM generations. So a lot of times when people have things like LLM-based chatbots, they log the actual inputs and outputs. And so what you can do is if you're accurately logging this from a chatbot experience, you can then run these evaluations on sort of the expected output that you've got here. So now similar to the classification task, we're going to be inserting the input into some different applications that we're gonna define and then comparing the output here. And to do that, we're going to be comparing it with another language model to actually do and assign that score. And so now we need the actual applications to test. And we're going to be defining two super, super simple ones. They're just going to be very basic question and answer setups with the context of the web pages inserted into the prompt. And so we'll have two set up. We'll have one with OpenAI GPT 4.0 and one with Mistral 7B running locally on my laptop. And so this is about as simple as it gets. It's just using the OpenAI client with the Langsmith wrapper here. For the message, it's just answer the user's question, two to three sentences with this context. And then the full text of this blog post is then just inserted into the prompt. And so that's going to return this as a dictionary with the answer as the key. Similarly enough here, all we're doing here with the Olama API is just inserting Olama and then calling Olama with Mistral, printing it a little bit with some streaming, and then the actual QA Mistral is just going to be very, very similar to the same. 
as up here, answer the user's questions, and then the user role is going to be answer my questions in two to three sentence, and then it's just going to be calling it, returning the answer as a response. So these are going to be our two quote unquote applications that we'll be assessing, and they're very much in the same, so we can actually then do these evaluations on the output quality of OpenAI versus the output quality of this local Mistral 7B model running on my laptop. And so to do this, we're going to be using some of the built-in functionality with LangSmith, the LangChain String Evaluator. And so this essentially has some built-in evaluators within LangSmith that will use a language model to assess a string or evaluate a string. And they have a lot of pre-built ones that you can use. Um, they have things for like correctness, contextual Q&A, chain of thought Q&A for contextual accuracy, um, embedding distance. And we'll break down a few more of these specifically, but they have all sorts of criteria that you can actually implement. Things like conciseness, relevance, correctness, coherence, et cetera, et cetera, or your own custom criteria, which we'll get into a little bit later. For our example, we're going to be using the LangChain String Evaluator with chain of thought contextual accuracy on question and answering. So what this is going to do is it will compare the LLM generated response to the question with the expected answer from the data set using another language model, GPT-4, with built-in chain of thought reasoning and chains. So actually setting up these evaluators is very similar to how we set up the custom evaluator above. We're just defining the evaluator now as this link chain string evaluator with the argument, oops, with the argument COTQA. The data set name is then going to be agent data set. And then using the evaluate function, we're going to map over to QA OAI, which is going to be our question and answering OpenAI app right here. With the data set, the evaluator for COTQA, the experiment prefix, and then some metadata. Similarly, uh, down here, we're going to be doing it for Mistral as well. So let's just run both of these with the chain of thought question and answering evaluation. And I'll get back when this runs. Perfect. So both of those have ran. So let's actually dig into this one with the QA OAI. So we're seeing very similarly the input, the output. This is from our regular agent data set that we defined earlier. And so these would be our sort of expected answers to the questions that we've come up with. And so then this is the test here. And we're seeing that this is actually going to be the output from the language model. And we can actually reveal the full text here. So this is going to be the answer from the language model from this question through our application. And that goes on for there. And then this is the score that it's actually gotten from the chain of thought QA Langsmith evaluator. And so let's actually look at what this evaluator did. So going here to the run, what we're seeing is that it has its own custom prompt here. So it says your teacher grading a quiz, you're given a question, the context question is about, and the student's answer. You're asked to score the student's answer as either correct or incorrect based on the context, et cetera, et cetera. So LangChain actually set this up, this prompt, and it's going to be using GPT-4. And so the question is then going to be, what is the primary function of LLM and autonomous agents? And that is, of course, our, if we go here, our initial question here. And so hopping back over to this, we'll see that the context is the LLM functions as the core controller or brain of autonomous agents. And that context is going to be the actual reference output. And then what it's going to be scoring on is <clears throat> the student answer or our application output here, which is what this is. And then it says that the student's answer aligns with the context provided. The student correctly identifies the LLM as the core controller or brain, et cetera, et cetera, adds more details, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, the student's answer is factually correct. And so that's where we finally get this COT contextual accuracy score of one. Looking at something like this, where it actually scored a zero, what we can see happening down here is we'll see, you know, this is the context, how, or this is the question, how do autonomous agents use tool APIs? This is the context or sort of our expected answer. And then this is the student answer. And it claims that the student's answer does not directly align with the context provided. Context states that autonomous agents use tool APIs to extend their capabilities beyond the model's weights, allowing access to current information, code, execution, and proprietary data. 
The student's answer, while detailed and accurate in its own right, does not mention these specific uses of the tool APIs. Instead, it discusses the integration of APIs through a central LLM and provides examples of such systems. So this is really going to be heavily, heavily looking at your context or sort of expected reference when it's assessing the answer from your LLM application. So what you have here is your reference output is very, very much what it's going to be comparing against, not necessarily your actual ground truth. So it might have been right and doing a lot of these things, talking about the right stuff here, but it's just going to be looking at your references. So this is perfect for when you have example questions and example outputs that you know are factually what you're expecting to actually do this um, evaluation. <clears throat> and so going over and hiding the full text, we can see that this went over with Mistral as well, and that's great. And so then what we can do similarly is actually compare the two. So looking at both of these, we have OpenAI as the baseline, and then Mistral over here as the comparison to the baseline, and then we're comparing the contextual accuracy evaluation. So we see that actually, pretty much, they had three of the same, but then Mistral beats it out on one, and then OpenAI wins on another. So pretty, pretty similar, but we can compare them together here and see their accuracy scores. And this was all done with an LLM as an evaluator, looking at all of these and comparing it to the reference or ground truth here. Before we dig into the custom criteria that you can actually set up for using an LLM as a judge, let's check out some of the other built-in ones. So they have stuff like helpfulness, which I just grabbed from their documentation here. So let's run those on our OpenAI and our Mistral and just see another evaluation on a different criteria that's not just the chain of thought contextual accuracy. Phenomenal. So all of this has ran. Let's check it out real quick. Great. Looks like GPT-4 Omni is a very helpful, helpful model, especially in this. So let's look a little bit at this run. It's going to be very, very similar. Let's see. Submitting an, you're assessing a submitted answer on a given task based on a set of criteria. Here's the input. Here's the submission. The criteria is helpfulness. Is the submission helpful, insightful, and appropriate? So respond yes, if not respond no. This is the end data. And so yeah, we're seeing that the criterion for this task is the helpfulness of the submission. <clears throat> then it says the submission provides detailed explanation, goes further to explain how the LLM leverages its language understanding and is appropriate. So based on all of this, it is insightful, helpful, appropriate, and gains a score of yes. So. We see that it's very helpful. Looking at also, you know, Mistral's here, it's looking already like the helpfulness is at a one. But if we compare both of these, we can see that, yep, pretty much the model GPT-4 was able to determine and assign the score of yes for helpfulness, a binary true to all of these. So that's great. That's how you use the different custom criteria, or not custom, but the different um, included criteria now let's go a little bit more granular into actually defining your own criteria. So to set a little bit of context for the actual custom criteria, there's about four things that you should keep in mind when trying to determine exactly how to define your custom criteria. So right now in the Langsmith package, they have this all set up as such. You can define criteria, and that's going to give you binary scoring, similar to what we just saw here with either yay or nay, true or false, yes or no, one or zero or you can have a score string. And a score string is what's going to be for that numeric scoring, those things like a scale, scale of one to 10. Additionally, there's also labeled and unlabeled scoring. So the labeled evaluator evaluators will instruct an LLM to assess if the prediction satisfies the criteria, taking into account the quote unquote reference label. So that is similar to exactly what's happening here. So when you do a labeled evaluation, it's going to be comparing it to the reference. If it's unlabeled, just plain criteria, plain score string, it's going to be not looking at the reference and just running a quick LLM look at the, uh, at the actual output. So it's not going to be comparing it to this reference, just going to be giving it a arbitrary score defined on what you have set here. So let's actually break that down and try out some labeled and unlabeled um, <coughs> evaluations here. So to define these evaluators, I've broken it down into two sections, both unlabeled and labeled. 
So the unlabeled one is going to have a, a score string and a criteria, and the labeled one will have also a score string and a criteria. And so right now, as we're setting it up with unlabeled, so this means that there's no ground truth and the LLM is going to assess this at face value. I have first a score string here. So you're just going to take the Langchain string evaluator and pass in the argument score string, and then a config dictionary. The config dictionary is going to take the criteria argument, and then this is going to be my new criteria that I'm defining. So I'm interested in objectivity. And my criteria description is going to be for the score string on a scale of one to 10, how unbiased and impartial is this submission? Rate it based on the extent to which it presents information and facts without personal opinions or slanted perspectives aligning with the objective truth of the topic. And so then what we can do is actually also pass in this normalize by, and I'm normalizing it by 10. So it'll take this scale of one to 10 and turn it into like a 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, if it got a one, five or an eight as the final score. And so that's going to be our objectivity score string evaluator. Similarly for the criteria, the binary yes or no, all we're going to pass in for Langchain string evaluator is that it's going to be criteria. And then in the config, this objectivity is going to be worded a little bit differently. It's going to be, is this submission unbiased and impartial, presenting information and facts without personal opinions or slanted perspectives, ensuring it aligns with the objective truth of the topic? So instead of saying, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how it's is, and that's going to give either a one or a zero. zero. So that's how I'm setting up these unlabeled. So it's not referencing anything in the actual data set. It's just going to be running the, um, the base face value on the LLM. The labeled version, so this is going to be referencing the data, are set up pretty similarly, but with a little extra preparement. So right now it's going to require an extra prepared data argument, which we're going to see down here, that will take in a prediction, a reference, and an input. Similar to sort of the above stuff that we've put together, this will be referencing the run. So the run is the LLM output or the example, which is going to be the data set. And so looking at this, we're going to pass in labeled criteria. So this is going to be the binary, yes or no. We see here that this is the same objectivity criteria as what we've got here. However, now we have this quick Lambda function to actually input and prepare the data with prepare underscore data. So Right now it's taking in run and example, which is going to take in the LLM run and the example from the data set. And so the prediction is actually going to be the answer output from the run that we get. So this is going to be what our app actually outputs. The reference is then going to be the outputs example. So that is going to be like right here, this reference. And then the input is going to be the question here. So that's the question, phenomenal. And so once we have this set up, very similarly to the score string, we have just labeled score string here now with still the same normalize, still the same criteria here, but just preparing the data as such. So if we run, if we load these up and load these up, let's actually run these. So what we can do now is actually run multiple evaluators at once. So this is, as I was saying earlier, how you put evaluators into a list to run multiple. This is just exactly what it's looking at. Where we have an unlabeled evaluators list here, but just the unlabeled evaluators, and then the labeled evaluators here, and then we're routing to the data set, agent data set. So let's define that. <clears throat> and then let's run, here we go. We have four experiments here. Unlabeled evaluators with GPT-40, unlabeled evaluators with Mistral 7B, labeled evaluators with GPT-40, labeled evalu evaluators with Mistral 7B. And so this is all following the exact same evaluate function that we've defined earlier with routing to the app that we want to use, the data set, the evaluators, a custom prefix, and custom metadata. So let's run all four of these and then peep the results. Sweet. So now those have ran. Let's take a look first at like the unlabeled evaluators. Show you what that looks like. So right now, as you can see, since we passed in multiple evaluators into one evaluate function, we now have both experiments show up when clicking this, um, this link here. And so we've got the objectivity, which is going to be the binary one or, n one or no, or the score string, which is going to be a score out of 10. So as we can see, 
similarly to what we've been going over. We've got the original input, the reference output, and then let's actually dive into what this looks like unlabeled. So pulling up the criteria unlabeled score string, we look here, we can see that it's a very similar prompt to what we were going over earlier, but then the criteria here is going to be passed through like this. Is this submission unbiased and impartial? This is what I put for the criteria. And then this is the submission primary function, and then it ends. And so it determines that there's no evidence of personal opinion, submission aligns with the objective truth of the topic. It's just very explanatory. And that, yes, this is all based on this analysis. It meets the criteria of objectivity and gets a true. But what we can see here is that there's no actual reference to the data set or sort of our expected answer of what we're looking for. So this is just going to be taking it at face value, and that's what the actual unlabeled evaluations mean. Similarly to the score string, this is going to look very, very similar. If we go over here, it's going to be similar, you know, similar prompt to what we've seen for different score strings, slightly different because it's going to be on a scale. And then we can see that the output here, systems response is objective and impartial, provides all this, it's all good doesn't uh, favor any particular perspective, rating of 10. And so that 10 is normalized by 10 and turns out to be one. So we can see that the unlabeled OpenAI results all performed very well, phenomenal. Let's take a look now at the labeled evaluators. So for this example, we'll hop into labeled evaluators from the Mistral 7B response here. And we can see that, oh, there's actually a couple that are different. So let's dig into this. So now that it's labeled, and we look at this evaluator run for the criteria, so this is labeled criteria, which means it's going to be a binary, yes or no, and then also have reference to the, um, to the data set, which we can see there, this is what it gives us. So now we're seeing the input, phenomenal, the LLM submission, the criteria of objectivity, and the actual reference. So this reference is coming from the data set, and then the output says, let's see, it's objectivity. Looking at the submission, states this. This is factual information. However, it also includes a statement about natural language interfaces being unreliable due to formatting errors or rebellious behavior. This statement seems to be an opinion rather than an objective fact. I'm not sure how much I would trust this. And of course, this also comes with a word of warning. We're using language models now to run these evaluations. So take all of these evaluations with a grain of salt as they are language model outputs. And comparing the submission to the reference, submission does not mention the use of short-term memory for in-context learning and long-term memory for retaining and recalling information, which are key aspects. Therefore, does not fully meet the criteria of objectivity as it includes an opinionated statement and omits key factual information. Whether or not this is true, you know, to be up, up to your criteria, I would say, but pretty good call out as what it is doing is explicitly looking at this reference and comparing the output. So in comparison to the reference might not be the most objective. And so it actually fails here. Similarly enough here on the score string, we can see that it's a labeled score string. So now we have the question, we have the assistant answer, and then this is the ground truth. So the ground truth is going to be then what we're comparing this against and also our reference from the data set that we have put in there. So that's what this labeled is giving us. And then as it's saying, you know, introduces irrelevant information about natural language interfaces, which funnily enough, I actually know is in the blog, but this is explicitly comparing it to the question or, or to the reference that was asked. So in reference to this, it might not be a little bit accurate. So it gets this rating of four. So that is now going on all behind the scenes perfectly well. And we can see that it's done. And if we go over here to the experiments, we can see that we now have our objectivity and our score string objectivity for both labeled and unlabeled with OpenAI and Mistral 7B. We can then also you know, compare these two and see for our labeled objectivity, we can see that Mistral has one regression versus the baseline of OpenAI here with reference. So that is how 
you set up your custom criteria and then also you can either make it very unlooking at the data or directly referencing the data with both labeled and unlabeled criteria and score strings. So everything we've looked at so far has really gone line by line and done an experiment line by line. So what we've seen is we've got the input, we've got the output, we're testing the application output and then running the evaluators to find the scores. However, let's say that your evaluation of interest is not actually on the individual run level, but on the overall experiment level, or getting maybe some summary statistics out that aren't necessarily related to each individual run, but the overall runs themselves. So to explain further what this is and how it works, I've set up another quick evaluation and another quick experiment. So just to show how you can pack a lot of these built-in criterias into evaluators and run them all at once, I put this helpfulness score string, conciseness score string, and coherence score string with these arguments here with the link chain string evaluator, score string with the config of the predefined criteria, put them all in a list, and then ran the QA Mistral app that we defined earlier on all of these here. And so what this has done is given us this run that has all of these different scores. So this is also just another example of how you can run multiple at once. And then that's all good and in our experiments here. So you're seeing coherence, conciseness, helpfulness. But what if we're interested in doing an evaluation on all of the runs at once? So I've set up this simple example here. And the example is going to be sort of a pass fail. A pass is that the model output an answer successfully 80% of the time. And so what I've got here is just this quick function. It takes in the runs and the examples. It starts a count at zero. And then for each run, if the run has an answer output, it will add a plus one. And then the final logic is if that all maths out to 80% of um, the runs actually pass, it gets a true pass or if not, it gets a fail and the score is a false. And then we can use this evaluate existing argument. And so the evaluate existing argument takes in an experiment name, which in this case is going to be this experiment name, which you can also grab from the dot experiment name method here, which I've just done there to make it easy to replicate going over this multiple times. And then you pass in the summary evaluators, which can also be taken as a list. So running this real quick, we can run that and see what it outputs. So perfect, did that. Actually heading into this, you're not going to see anything really change on the individual experiment page, but then going out, what we can see is that now this pass score has popped up here on this experiment. So it's been added and we can see that 100% have passed or it has gone through and been determined that this is a pass because over 80% of the time an output is generated and we know this to be true just because of what we've seen. So that's great. So this is how you can sort of put together overarching things. You could do some of, some of LangChain's other examples here are sort of multi, um, multi-variable calculations like F1 scores that you can calculate where you need to be looking at all of the runs or like precision and accuracy, score, accuracy scores where you need to be looking at all of the runs to calculate this. So that's how you would actually access that with the evaluate existing function and then passing all of this in. But then it will show up here and that is perfect. And then we can see here that there's one pass. That's great. Along the same lines of running evaluations on existing experiments, we can also run pairwise evaluations. So what this does is it allows you to really evaluate existing experiments against each other. For this example, we'll be using an LLM as a judge, evaluating its preference between two outputs from an LLM, from two different LLMs from an existing evaluation. And so this could be useful for what I'm about to do to compare two small model outputs using a large model or sort of similar to what you've seen with some of the things like um, Chatbot Arena where you're preferencing one over the other. <clears throat> so to set this up, and I pulled this directly from Langsmith's documentation, I'm pulling this prompt, the pairwise evaluation too. And if we head over here, we can take a look at what that looks like. So 
Perfect. It's going to say, please act as an impartial judge and evaluate the quality of the responses provided by two AI assistants to the user question displayed below. You should choose the assistant that follows the user's instructions and answers the user's questions better. Your evaluation should consider factors such as helpfulness, relevance, accuracy, depth, et cetera, et cetera. Be as objective as possible. And so we're going to be passing in the question, the different answers, and then having the LLM actually give us an expected score of which one it prefers. So to do this, we'll be using GPT-4 Omni and running in sort of the questions, the answers here, and then getting out a preference score. So let us define this. And then to actually run this, we're going to be using the evaluate comparative function. And then we're going to be putting in the OAI helpfulness eval and the Mistral helpfulness eval. So we'll be taking the, let's grab these, the helpfulness that we did here. Oops. So down here, helpfulness. It will be taking these. It will be taking the outputs from both the OpenAI model and the Mistral model, as well as the input questions, and then determining its score or its favored one here. And so to do this, I'm using the same method of experiment name to grab that and then running the evaluate pairwise function in through here. And so when we run this, it will finish like that. And then looking at it, it has a different interface now. So perfect. We can see now the side by side of which outputs the LLM, which in this case was GPT-4 Omni that we're using to do this pairwise evaluation preferred. So four out of five times, it actually prefers the OpenAI response, which is itself, which might make sense. So it would be interesting to see what different um, models actually do these pairwise evaluations with. But you can see comparatively that four out of the five it preferred for OpenAI, and then one out of the five it preferred for Mistral. So this is how you can sort of automatically do the comparison and pairwise evaluation here with an LLM as a judge. Going back to the data set real quick, we can also click on pairwise evaluations here and see a quick summary of ranked preference, which is OpenAI versus Mistral here. So four to one, OpenAI wins. Linksmith also has an integration with PyTest to attach on to PyTest unit testing as well. And you can do this, set it up to your PyTest unit tests, which may already be existing, and then log them with Langsmith and view and compare them as such. And you can take in a lot of interesting stuff then with these unit tests, as you can really get pretty granular with actually defining useful ones for language model output. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So now going over to VS Code here, what we've got is this super quick quote unquote application. And so what it's going to be is just popping in chat o llama with llama3 and then the prompt is going to be, you are an AI assistant for generating Python. Generate a Python code snippet that answers the following question. Keep your answer concise. Only include the necessary code snippet with no preamble or explanation. We run that through a quick chain with langchain and then just a quick function. So it's just going to be generate. Then this generate function is going to take the input. It's going to invoke the question and then return the response. So. Just as an example, this is going to, if you put in how do I write a for loop for, with range 10 in Python. So running that, what we get here is for i in range 10. That's great. And so then what we can do is actually set up some PyTest tests to evaluate our application here, which is just our Python generating Llama 3 app. So I've set up a few here to show some basic examples. So Right here, what you can see, this is what you're going to be doing. You're going to import unit and then use the unit decorator on top of your regular PyTest tests to attach it and make it traceable with Langsmith. And so then you can follow really the general test um, format with just importing your function from the prior file and then writing a test for it. And then here I just have the query, how do I write a for loop um, with range 10 in Python? And then the output is a simple assertion. So the assertion will be for i in range 10. So it's going to look and see if this is exactly what we get. If it's exactly what we get, it's going to assert true or false. And just briefly looking back at the documentation, what we can see here is with the assertions, it'll give a one or a zero. But 
they also have an expect method, which is super useful for actually doing the evaluations for language models. And some of the expectations that you can put in look a, bit, a little bit like this. So for our second test, we're going to be using expect with the to contain method. So our query is going to be, how do I make a list in Python? And then the output, I'm hoping to contain these brackets. So then I'll know that the list is likely there. And so this can be useful, especially when um, you understand that language models don't actually tend to generate the same thing over and over with a consistent, um, consistently. So you can see and check if it contains very like, you know, specific things to your use case. This might be even like SQL. You could see if it accurately looks for a <clears throat> different database identifier or a different key identifier that you're looking for with the to contain method. There's plenty of other methods. There's to equal, to contain, against, to be between for different values, to be less than, all sorts of the things that you'd expect. And then additionally down here for our test three, we'll be using some more experimental stuff. So actually it's embedding distance and edit distance. And these are very specifically used for fuzzy matching or sort of looking at two strings and then asserting whether or not they're similar, not necessarily exact or not necessarily that they contain, but their similarity. So for this, I'll say, how do I write hello world in Python? My reference is then going to be print hello world like this. And then we'll do the generate function on this query. And so the two fuzzy matching things that we'll use here is embedding distance, and this is using OpenAI embeddings, and you just put in the prediction and then the reference, which is going to be this print. And then I added this optional to be less than 0.5. And so we'll see where that shows up in the actual Langsmith output, or you can do the edit distance too with this name that I'm not even gonna try and pronounce. And similarly enough, I put in the prediction and the reference. So let's actually run these tests and then check out how that looks in Langsmith. There we go. Perfect. So it looks like three passed in 12 seconds. Now let's hop over to Langsmith and see what that looks like. Now when we're over here in our data, data sets and testing, we see this new data set, none.testUnitTestEval. And looking at it here, we can see edit distance, embedding distance, expectation, and the passes here. So let's take a peek. And so we can see all three of our runs here. So we see that the this is likely the pass one. If we look at the trace, we'll see that, yes, this is the loop. So for i in range 10, and our assertion here was just to see for i in range 10, and that is true. So our output here is a pass, binary one. The second example here, let's look at this trace. With this one is the list. So we can see that what it output was my underscore list equals with the two brackets. What we were looking for is the expectation of to contain these two brackets. So heading back out, we see that the expectation is good and that the general pass from the PyTest test is good. And then finally, we can see a bunch of other stuff here. So what we're seeing here is now going to be the embedding distance and the edit distance in um, reference to this reference of print hello world. So actually looking at this run, what we should see is that the output is print hello world, not exactly what we have here with the exclamation point and the comma, but we can then see that the edit distance is very low with 0.09. The embedding distance is also very low with 0.04. And then our expectation of the embedding distance to be less than 0.5 turned out to be true. And also the test passed, which is a one. So this is a phenomenal way of actually being able to write and apply your unit testing with Langsmith on different LLM applications without having to do any sort of super fancy stuff. And so our final evaluation topic is actually going to be attaching evaluators within existing runs and existing applications that we have. And to show an example of how I do this, I'm going to be using my Llama 3 research agent, which just posted a video which would pop up right now on, and I'm gonna show you how I actually attached the evaluations within it post making that. So hopping over, what I've done here is this is all the same as what I've gone through in my video for this web research agent. 
but I've actually attached from Langsmith, you can import this traceable. And so this traceable decorator can be attached to any sort of function that you've got to be traced then in Langsmith. And so just running a quick test with what's our Apple's Q3 earnings, not my best grammar moment. We got this response, a little bit weird on the markdown formatting, all good, but we can hop over to Langsmith and see that this is traced. So looking at this, we're seeing that our traceable run agent is being traced, and then we're seeing it go through all of the steps that we expect, routing, optimization, search, generation. So it transforms the query, searches, generates, exactly what we'd expect, perfect. But what we want to do then is, what if we have these traces? But what we actually wanna do is then attach onto the traces and run specific evaluations at specific times. So as I've put it here, what if you have an existing application that's being traced and you want to insert evaluations at specific parts of the operation? Well, if you have it being traced already with Langsmith, that is very easy to do. So what we're going to do is create a super quick data set to test this agent against. And this data set is absolutely nothing fancy. It is simply two questions. What, what Apple's Q3 earnings and what are new Apple products? And then just an example answer that I pasted in here. And so we've named it Apple L3 agent testing and then inserting it into our data set very, very similarly to what we've been doing. So looking over here, we now have both of our inputs and outputs. So these are going to be our input questions that we're going to test our model output against. So let's define some custom evaluators. So right now I'm going to be using structured function calling alongside OpenAI to create a quick LLM as a judge evaluator. And this is also taken as um, from the documentation from Langsmith. So definitely check that out for a little bit more of a deep dive into this, but let's go over it as well and show you how I route to the specific parts of the run to actually attach these evaluators. So there's two parts of this program that I actually want to evaluate the search tool test, and that's going to be an evaluator that checks if the retrieve web search actually contains the answer for the question, and then a hallucination test. That's going to check to see if the answer is grounded in the context that it gets. And so to put this together, what you're going to be taking advantage of is these examples, runs, and the roots. So here we're seeing we're going to get the documents and answer. And so what we're doing here is actually using these root runs and child runs. And this can be a little bit confusing, but all you need to simply understand is that if you go over back to your projects and check out the runs, so if we like look at this one, this is what we're going to be looking at. What you're especially going to want to do is actually click show all, because that's how you're going to see what the runs are and what the child runs are. So for example, this run agent run, the child run would be LangGraph, transform query, web search, and generate. The child run for generate might be this generate and also this channel write. So looking at what we did here, we've got the agent run. And so our root run is just going to be the basic run of our application, which in this case is going to be our agent. And we're grabbing the run agent run. So that is going to be right here, this specific first one. We're then going to go down into this LangGraph run right here so that what we can do is grab the search run. And so then the search run will be here because we're going to go to web search. So what we've done with this is gone from run agent to lane graph to web search. And then from web search, we can actually grab some stuff here. So I have the context, which is going to be the search run, which is going to be this web search here. And we're going to be grabbing the outputs context, which is going to be this. And this right here, this outputs and context, this is dependent on how it's actually going to be put in within your application. So make sure you're checking to see sort of how those are being input and how those are being output, your different information. I'm referencing the output of the web search as quote unquote context. So that is where I'm going to be routing towards. So I'm going to be searching the contents of the outputs of the search run for the context that's going to be that. I'm then also grabbing the question. And so that I'm just using the base run, the agent run, so all the way up here. And then this is going to be query 
So I'm putting query here as the inputs. So now we have the context from the web search and then the question from the query. And so then what we're doing is creating a quick um, Pydantic data model right here, creating a LLM, we're using GPT-4 Omni, attaching the structured Pydantic data model to it. And then what we're doing is giving it a prompt. So it's a grader assessing whether a web search contains the context needed to answer a user query. Give a binary score one or zero, where one means that the answer is in the web search results. And so then we attach this with some from messages with the system and a human message, attach it all into a chain, invoke it, and then we return the web search verification as the key, and then the score from the score. And so this is going to be referencing our data model, which it's going to call here with our prompt to actually just insert that so that we can have a little bit more of a structured output to get the score here. And so that's going to be what pops up in Langsmith later on down the line. Very, very similarly, we're going to be doing a hallucination test that checks to see if the answer is grounded in the context. Similarly to what we did, we've mapped to the agent, to the agent run, we mapped through from the agent run to Langgraph, and then through Langgraph to the web search, we grab the outputs from the context of the search run. And then, funnily enough, we actually instead grab the generation. So we go to Langgraph, which has this generate and generation right here. And then we're going here to the outputs generation and grabbing that. So now instead we're going to be comparing the context with the generation to make sure that the LLM generation is grounded in or supported by a set of retrieved facts. And then very simply enough, passing it through to a Langchain, um, Langchain chain, invoking that, and then returning the answer hallucination score. So as you can see here, it's getting a little bit complicated, but now with these LLM as a judge um, ideas, you can actually go through and create very, very specific tests with your own specific prompts that go into and grab dynamic output from traced runs in your applications. So if your application, similar to mine, is set up already with Langsmith, you can go through, find the specific data input that you want, and then run these experiments. So let's do just that. What we do now is use the evaluate function. We have a quick inputs um, lambda function here that will just get the inputs ran and running the run agent which is going to be our main flow here for actually invoking our web research agent. We're going to be running it on our data set here. So the L3, so the inputs here from the data set are what we're passing in here. This input is going to be what's Apple's Q3 earnings, what are new Apple products. And then we're gonna be running the evaluators and attaching a prefix. So let's see this in action. Awesome, so that's ran. What we can see here is that it ran both at the same time. So it input both of the inputs in, ran them all sort of in parallel. This is just all of the prints that happens when you're running the run agent function that I've got through. And then we can take a look at the experiment. So checking out the experiment here, we can see that the answer hallucination is one, which means that it is not being hallucinated. One means that the answer is grounded in, supported by the set of facts, and also web search verification of one, which means that the answer to the question is ground is being contained in the web search. So essentially what we're doing is we're testing the generation, seeing if there is any hallucinations, and also we're testing the web search tool to see if it's getting us the accurate information that we want based on our web query. So just digging a little bit into some of these runs, and looking at like the web search verification, you can see that we've dynamically inserted some of the stuff from the trace here. So we're seeing that this is the system prompt that we inputted, perfect. And then here's the web search context. And then here's the question. And then its output was binary score of one. We can see that it uses a function call because that's what we're doing with the Pydantic data model here to just make that output a little bit easier to parse, and that's perfect. But also similarly with the hallucination, we'll see that 
the output is actually the set of facts. So that is the web search context and then the LLM generation. And then we're seeing that, give it a score of one. So that's perfect. So now you can see how you can actually insert these custom evaluators or language model-based evaluators into specific parts of your trace in LangSmith with an existing application. So you can pull with these root runs and child runs and stuff, the relevant information that you need as it's running to do these comparisons and evaluations. So really to end us all off, we've gone over a lot of topics of really setting up custom evaluations, both with hard-coded things, unit testing, pairwise examples, using LLMs as judges, and setting up all sorts of custom criteria. There's much, much more that you can do with Langsmith, but I think this is really a useful, useful thing for actually being able to do those tests and see some real clear data on whether or not your applications are performing well. So with that being said, good luck making your own evaluations. If you have any questions or anything of how I put this together, please let me know. All of this code is going to be available in the description below. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time.